If you try quitting while you're on active duty and you're like doing your full-time job, look, you, you kind of just become an I've got uh, two beautiful little girls and you know, that's part of why I'm doing this too. We used to do these road trips and, yeah. and he was from Boston and Massachusetts. And as a kid, I just remember like, it was obviously freezing out. So the windows were up, but I didn't stop our parents from smoking. I would beg him like on my hands and knees, please stop smoking. Please stop smoking. I want you to live. We need cooks. We need supply. You don't have to say that you were special forces. We, knew, you were an essential part of the mission. I just didn't encourage you all out there to to just check on your buddies. Everybody quit smoking. Welcome back to the He's Wrong, She's Right podcast. I'm Andrew. This is Nona, and today we're joined with Matt Kenny from Smoke Less Vets. Uh, as well as Vote America. Matt, thanks for coming on the show. Andrew Nota, thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. Um, let's jump right into it. Uh, Baker made the introduction. I had heard of Smokeless Vets previously. Um, you seem to, like you said earlier, uh, pre-show, uh, you've been making the rounds. I don't, I can't pin down where exactly I heard about you. But when I pulled up your website, I saw JT right there, right at the top. So I'm pretty sure it was probably something on social media, something maybe JT posted. So that's great. Um, tell, go ahead, tell us about it. Tell us, tell us what you got going on. What's your mission? Yeah, uh, first, just, you know, let's send our prayers out, out to Baker too. You know, that storm is, I think, ripping through his backyard and, and I'm just praying that everything is all right with our brother over there. Um, yeah, so, I don't know, uh, maybe the best place to start is, is how I got involved in, in the veteran advocacy space and, and how that led to uh, Vote for America and Smokeless Vets. Like, these are both uh, pretty incredible movements of, of veterans who are trying to approach and, and educate and, and help get other veterans to do things to help themselves. So I'll jump into that a little bit later, but uh, I think that it's, it's important to share how I got into the space too. Yeah, and, absolutely. And I think that maybe that's a, that it'll be a, a guide for other people to get involved and, and get more civically engaged too. So, um, you know, like, like a lot of veterans, when I had first transitioned out, I was having a tough time. Uh, this is something, you know, our, our buddy uh, Zach and I talked about too, is you don't, know what you don't know um and when you get out it's uh shocking uh how, how much of a transition the things that you need to rebuild and the foundation that you need to build for yourself and and if you're like me for your for your family for your wife and your kids too when did so, you get out i got out in 2013. Okay. shortly after i or a couple of years after i did um I, so I, I did listen to the conversation, like I said, uh, you spoke a lot about Arizona. Did you, were you originally from Arizona and then went back after you got out or was that a college decision? How did that work? Yeah, my parents uh, met, my mom was originally from Tucson. Uh, she's a second generation Arizonan. And my dad was stationed at Davis Moth at Air Force Base. They met, uh, got married and uh, you know, traveled around a little bit when you're on active duty and then my parents split and we moved back to Arizona, but really from kindergarten on, uh, spent my time back in Arizona and Tucson, uh, and Arizona, great places to grow up, had a lot of fun, um, witnessed nine 11 in a classroom. And, and that's really where I feel like this story really takes off. I had a core group of, of friends three out of the four of us joined the military, one enlisted in the Marine Corps right away. Uh, I went into Army Infantry and the other one went in as an uh, Army Armor guy. So and did you go green yeah. to gold then? Or how did no. you transition to officer? Yeah, so I did, uh, I did ROTC at Arizona State University. Okay. And uh, what made you decide to make that transition to an officer? Did you just feel like you wanted to um, you know, improve leadership? Did you feel that you could be a better leader than ones that you had, or were you just inspired by good leaders? 
I think a lot of it had to do with already being a leader on the field and in sports in other areas of my life. And when I was exploring different programs, I was looking at uh, mostly the ROTC programs. I had already committed to you know, going to college. I was already really in my first year before I, I, uh, I took the, the formal steps to, to be in the military. And so I think uh, that was a big part of it. It was that I had already felt like I had some leadership skills uh, to provide to the military and it came naturally to me. So how long were you en enlisted before you transitioned to and in commissioned? No, so I'm sorry, we... Um, you, you went in initially through ROTC is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, so okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I was, when you said you went in infantry, I thought you were saying you, you went in enlisted and then later went through the ROTC program. So, okay. Makes sense. Clarified all that for me. Now. I'm not, I'm kind of autistic and I'm not very smart. So that's why no, she's looking at me all weird. Me too. No, I'm like miscommunicating. Even I followed that story and I'm not military. Um, so uh, I'm just going to ask then, were you a smoker at some point? Did you have an issue with um, smoke and tobacco products? Is that kind of what led you down um, or inspired you to create the organization? Yeah. So when, when you're in, and especially when you're deployed and when you're in combat, uh, tobacco becomes part of the, the culture, part of the, the you know, to community, but a lot of it is practical. It's to stay awake, stay alive, stay alert. Um, but sometimes it's, you know, purely out of boredom. And, you know, sometimes you're uh, watching, you know, concrete dry, uh, or you need something to, to, to keep yourself awake. And so a lot of times, you know, I think that that veteran and service members uh, lean on on tobacco products. And that was definitely the case for me. Admittedly, I had started um, a little bit earlier. I, I had started when I was in college before I was technically, you know, in, in the service. Um, but it, it got worse. Or, or I, I guess I started using it more consistently and more of it when I was on active duty and especially when I was deployed. So what is that when you want to quit, right? I think that it makes it a little, it makes it more difficult. You're, you're already addicted to it. Uh, you know, you, it's already a, a habit, a part of your life too. So I had a really difficult time. So I had dipped, uh, you know, traditional dip for about 15 years. I was really looking for a way to transition off of it was, was not having an easy go of it. Um, and then I, I tried using these nicotine pouches uh, i've used a variety of, of of different ones they're all a little bit different and i was like this works this this helps you at least try to you know transition to something that's a little bit healthier and then you know if you want to transition all the way off it makes it even easier too it's a you know kind of a step down program that i think works really well uh and so as I started to learn about this, I was like, oh, well, you know, this would have been really helpful to me if I were on active duty, um, right. you know, and, and when, if you try quitting while you're on active duty and you're like doing your full time job, look, you, you kind of just become an <laughs> if, you, if you can imagine. Right. Because you're like going through uh, kind of like nicotine withdrawals. And, and at the same time, you're still just as tired and just as overwhelmed as you were before. So I was like, man, you know, this harm reduction strategy would have been so helpful if I were on active duty. And so me, I think uh, uh, some other uh, veterans, but really just, just other people who are passionate about helping our, our veterans and military got together and, and this organization were like, well, you know, what better way to make a difference than for, for us to try to do it ourselves? Us as members of the veteran community too, and having gone through the experience, um, I think that we could connect really well with other veterans and hopefully we could encourage the VA you know, the places in state uh, that also uh, handle issues like this. You're in Arizona. We have a Department of Veterans Services that uh, d does a lot of uh, work with our veteran community. And so introducing harm reduction education and resources uh, through those channels, I think, would be hugely impactful. 
So you guys, I've never worked directly with the VA. I have some friends that have and do. Um, is it difficult getting into those channels and being able to, um, you know, get the material and get them to listen and get them to take that issue seriously? Or do you think that's been kind of a, a pretty cut and dry, easy thing to do? We're working on it. I think that there's lots of opportunities for us to present our case uh, to the VA. I think there are also a number of different uh, politicians and bureaucrats that have their own priorities and have their own ways of thinking about things. So I think the biggest hurdle for us is is educating our policymakers, you know, and, and, and those bureaucrats in the in the VA on why this is so important to us as a community and why we think it would be so so impactful to uh, the veteran and military community overall. What uh, do you, do you happen to know this off your head or kind of a rough estimate? What uh, percentage of the active duty and veteran population consumes tobacco products? Yeah, I'm not sure if we know the the up to date percentage on the number of veterans that are are currently smoking. I think that it might be somewhere near nine hundred thousand. What 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 statistics we do know though is that we've surveyed uh, we've surveyed service members and and asked them if they were smoking, uh, how many of them want to uh, have tried quitting in the past? And it's it's half. So of your population of military service members who are currently smoking and dipping, half of them have tried to quit in the past. We asked that same group, how many of you would would want to would still want to quit, but haven't found a way to do it? And, and half of those. So we know that there are huge chunks of the population that at least attempted to quit in the past that want to uh, and then we have a, a huge chunk of, of service members who, who know that they want to quit, but they can't find a solution. So we're saying like, this is the solution. You know, you can provide options uh, for veterans and it doesn't have to be, you know, I talked about pouches, but one of the, I think, well, more critical places for us to make an impact is on smoking. You know, we know uh, the, adverse health effects of combustible cigarettes and and what we've learned in, in in science and research and studies have shown us is that your vaping products are actually 95 percent healthier than the smoking products or i mean your combustible cigarettes and so why we're not immediately trying to transition our veterans and our military service members off of traditional cigarettes and onto these considerably healthier products uh, it, you know, baffles me. It, it seems like, you know, there are some areas in which you can make a huge impact by making a, a, a little change. And this is one of them. Right. Do you, uh, have you guys had any luck with outreach to any of the major, uh, units, brigades or anything like that? Have you kind of tried to go that route or, um, what are some of the steps that, that you've taken so far? I, so like I said, I'm going in really, really rough, uh, into this. I was never a tobacco consumer and never have been. Um, yeah. my, my crutch has been caffeine and whiskey. So, um, <laughs> her, her face tells it all. Um, so yeah, you know, tell us about some of the ways that you've kind of worked through that. I know she has a bunch of, she wants to ask family questions. She's, she's big on the family oh, things. Yeah. You're, you're, uh, welcome to I'd love talking about my family. I've got, uh, two beautiful little girls and you know, that's part of why I'm doing this too. Is How old I are they? Help other other veterans and family members and, and leaders uh, live a live a healthier and longer lifestyle so they could take care of their kids. Uh, on our progress, I think we've made a ton of progress. Look, we've uh, been able to reach millions of veterans uh, through advocacy efforts just like this. Uh, uh, me and we've got uh, a, a gentleman named Doctor Vermillion. Uh, who's been able to get out there and, and really making a huge impact with our, our government officials and uh, with the with the kind of expert community. Uh, we, he and I together have gotten the opportunity to brief lawmakers, uh, to do uh, committee and uh, other hearings just like that. So I think that we're, we're, we're getting there. I think that there are lots of uh, other opportunities for us to, to step in and for us to share this message and we're gonna continue doing it. But I think that we've made a pretty good impact so far and we're starting to 
plant the seeds in the right places for them to uh, consider making changes that would be helpful like this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you guys, I'm oh, sorry, I, I Kanye'd my wife. That's a, that's a thing that we say when we interrupt no, each other on the show. I've been wanting to ask this question for like 10 minutes <laughs> and you, every time there's a pause, you have jumped ahead of me. So sorry. Get, get, carry on. Um, I, I just wanted to ask how long the uh, organization's been um, up, you know, how when did you stand it up and, and you know, how many people are backing you at this point? Yeah, honestly, this is a uh, a, a newer organization, um, but we've got dozens of veterans that are helping. You've seen we've got some uh, really great relationships with uh, different organizations and different podcasts like yours. Um, you know, we've had a lot of success and, and built a really great relationship with the Black Rifle uh, Coffee guys over there. I think we're making some inroads with our uh, our, our Drunken Bros podcast group and uh, Barstool Sports too. So I really like we're um, we're trying to spread the message everywhere we can, and we've built some really great partnerships already. Um, and and so I'm sure that there'll be lots in the future for for uh, us to brag about too. I'm not going to interrupt you this time. Go ahead. <sighs> okay. So you mentioned earlier that smoking during wartime often is um, kind of a survival to stay awake. And what if you posed to um, certain groups that are stationed elsewhere, kind of the herd mentality? Why don't you guys all quit together and let's experiment? What can we do to get you guys all to quit together because a lot of the times that people can't quit is because their buddy is still smoking their wife is still smoking their their mom is still smoking whatever the case may be and it's it's oh well they're doing it so it's okay so you think of like a challenge like a yeah. everybody does like a fitness challenge where everybody does yeah. 100 push-ups or whatever get the whole group to quit together i love it i think it's a great approach i think that it might be something that works really well uh in the veteran community too um, you guys like to so push each other, uh, you know, work with, uh, you know, every, a lot of veterans that I've come across and myself included have kind of a core group of those mm -hmm. guys they, they deployed with their, or that they served with and that they just, for some reason, keep in contact with those dozen or so folks, that might be a great, great way to tap into, uh, those, those different networks and, and, and do it. I love it. I love the challenge. So we we founded uh, last year, last July, um, and uh, as well as some other uh, veterans that I know from all across the country, both actually from Drinking Bros. I used to be their uh, web developer back in the day, um, nice. as well as some people that I know, the uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps League in South Bend, uh, and a couple other people. We founded Veteran Wiki, um, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. So we're going to definitely get you up there, get all your... Um, Oh, I love you know, bio of yourself. It's it's doing really well. Our problem is I can't find enough people to commit volunteer time, and we haven't really done a lot of fundraising. It's come out of my pocket for the most part to this point. Um, and as you know, everybody's more money motivated than they are about helping each other. I mean, let, let, uh, the hurricane aside, you know, when there's a natural disaster or a big problem, a lot of people do like to come together as a community and work together. But um, what I found is and I'm, I'm sure you've run into this as well. You know, people will say, hey, I want to commit to helping your organization. What can I do to help? Where can I help? And slowly, if you don't keep on top of them, you know, they kind of slip away. They're, they're basically the E4 mafia of the nonprofit space, essentially. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. Do you guys, do you run into a lot of issues with uh, um, keeping people on track with supporting the organization? Or do you think people have really bought into this? No, you know, I think there's a little bit of, of herding cats with every single organization. I think with our organization specifically, there is a lot of opportunity for each individual to be themselves and to go into their own networks or their own spaces in which they're super comfortable with. So that's a benefit to, to our organization. But uh, look, I've been working in the volunteer space for a decade too, and uh, I hear you, right? It, 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 I mean, I have found that it, it's almost best to cut things into tiny chunks and 
and kind of just deliver it to them. And honestly, a lot of times you've got to do 90% of the work. You've got to package it all for them. And sometimes volunteering operations are really, you know, kind of a service project in themselves just to get other people involved. I think long term, what I found is you you keep investing in those people, you keep uh, you know teaching them how to fish, then eventually they'll learn how to fish themselves, and then there'll be uh, an added benefit to the organization. But you know, volunteer operations are are, are a labor of love too. Yeah. I hear you. So, what can our audience or you know any audience do to help? get your organization smokeless vet specifically to that to that next level what are you guys looking for um and where are you at right now i would love for your listeners to go check out smokelessvets.org first we've got a lot of good information on there but what i would also like you to do is, is sign up uh so that we could share some information for you you'll see uh you'll see a sign up uh, part on the website and then the bigger thing that you could do is start talking uh, about this with your policymakers. So, you know, as a veteran, uh, I, I was mentioning earlier in the podcast, I worked in the veteran advocacy space. And that's really when I got out of uh, the military in 2013, the VA scandal happened in Phoenix where I was going to law school uh, in 2014. So just a year later. And that's really what, what got me involved in all of this. And I, uh, I had plenty of opportunities where I would be at a VA town hall or I would be at a, a veteran uh, centric event and you would see policymakers and they would say, hey, like, what can I do, you know, to help you in the veteran community that we're not already doing? And of course, we want to help with veteran suicides and veteran homelessness and, and uh, those top issues that are super important. But I think that you could also add that there is some low hanging fruit here for us to help with force readiness help with the health of our veterans and our service members. And, and that's to introduce harm reduction strategies uh, into the, the public health information education programs that, that they have. So I, I, I know uh, one, a couple of her burning questions uh, regarding family. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Emery King? No, he's no, a let me look. social media influencer, comedian guy. Um, former felon or reformed felon, however you want to say that. Emery King? Yeah, it's A-M-I-R-I. -I. It's spelled so, Amari. Yeah, well, oh, got Amiri. It. Yeah, oh, so, got it. All right. All right. So uh, I, I bring this up. We had him on a couple weeks ago, and one of the things that we brought up was smoking. and Because he was smoking during the episode, oh. and... <laughs> He, he made a comment, something along the lines of, you know, I've never really wanted to quit or anything like that. And she specifically asked him, you know, what if your kids asked you or have they ever asked you or something along those lines? No, what I, okay. Go so ahead. my dad has smoked his entire life since he was 14 years old. And yeah, um, yeah it's just uh, men born in the fifties, I guess. I don't know. You know. Really quick. Did you, we used to do these road trips and, yeah. and he was from Boston and Massachusetts. And as a kid, I just remember like, it was obviously freezing out. So the windows were up and I didn't stop our parents from smoking. When we were in the car. So we we're just like hot box the entire time. I don't know if you went through those experiences, but I think that's so funny. No, I did not. So that's one thing that my mom put her foot down before even marrying him was you will not be ever smoking in my house period so if you want to smoke you do it outside you take a walk around the block whatever that's your time if you're going to continue this and I love you but it will never be in this house so she at least put her foot down from that but no I can remember all the way back to like three four years old I would steal his cigarettes. I would hide them in the bottom of the trash can. I would um, go bury them in the backyard. I would beg him like on my hands and knees, please stop smoking. Please stop smoking. I want you to live. And he, from a very young age, would tell me, oh, I'm never going to live past 70. And he is 72 now. So he has passed his expiration date. And <laughs> so he, he put pretty traumatic things into my mind from a very young age of he is making this decision to continue smoking and I finally gave up around like six seven years old trying to get him to quit but I asked him I asked Amari 
Amory, sorry. It's spelled Amari, so I'm going to say it wrong forever. I asked Emery if his children had ever asked him to quit smoking, because I know that I had, and he said no, but if they had, he would have quit on the spot. So what about you? Uh, you said you have two children. Have they ever asked you? Not that I can remember. Um, and I don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe it was because they were so much younger too when I dipped. And uh, honestly, I mean, there have been times when I've, I've stopped for periods of time before, but um, for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, you got really long hours at work or, or something like that, that, uh, I picked up, I picked it back up again. Um, honestly, it, it, it never really came up in, in family discussions in, in the same way that it sounds like it, it, it did with you all. Um, I was the only one I of my think, siblings who did that. that. They encouraged me to be really healthy too. And, you know, uh, may, maybe it's because they don't, they, they haven't been educated on, you know, the negative impacts of, of, of chewing tobacco and, and nicotine yet. And that might be it. Is How it old are they? At, at nine and 13. Okay. So, so, so they right know. Yeah. We've got 14, 12, 10, and eight. Oh, nice. Yep. Three of which are here. They're actually on fall break this week. So they're, uh, if you ever hear any background noise while we're recording, they're probably running around trying to get snacks or use the bathroom or something. <laughs> yeah. No, I guess it's probably like, how do I compare it to be? I mean, the kids don't look at you having a sip of whiskey, right? As like, oh, this is like har hugely harmful or actually like if we expend, it could, we kind of expand the spectrum too to either drinking caffeine. They're not like, hey, you know, I don't want you to have a heart attack down the road because you've been drinking so much caffeine for 80 years. I think that they maybe just look at it like, oh, that's just one of those things that adults do that's maybe not as great for them. But um, I don't know that they look at it like it's going to be some, it's going to be a life ending uh, decision that I make. They've asked some questions, but they, I don't think that the way that they formed their question or how their question was informed was how it would be for any of us having this conversation. Theirs is more like, my friends, parents, or somebody at school talked about, you know, their dad or their mom or somebody um, died or is in the hospital because of it or something like that. So they, they, they know the contributing factor and they know the end result, but they don't know what happened in between. They don't know whether it was cancer. They don't know that it was liver failure. They don't know, you know, that it was some sort of heart condition or heart disease. They just know that this yeah. product created this end result how whatever happened in between they don't really care about <laughs> so yeah no that totally makes sense but it does bring up i think a kind of an in in sort of it's interesting that we treat uh these tobacco products from a regulatory standpoint completely different than we treat every other type of product i think that uh the justification is actually that it's you know this is purposeful and punitive for you know the tobacco companies not educating people on how dangerous their products were early on but it is really interesting um you know from a legal and a regulatory standpoint that that we've picked this one product this one thing that comparatively is is there there are other things out there that are just as dangerous but we've pick this industry to um, to make an example of. Uh, uh, an example is even your vape products are being taxed at rates similar to tobacco products because they, they're kind of falling in within that same industry. But if you look at the taxes over tobacco and tobacco, like similar tobacco products, you're at 200 to 1,000 percent. Could you imagine if you did the same thing to the liquor or the, the alcohol or uh, alcohol industry, right? Um, it would be astronomical prices for, for you know your your bottle of whiskey or your your, your just your uh, right. your your beers. Yeah, we're we're in North Carolina, so it's already a weird system to begin with. I don't know if you were ever stationed at uh, Liberty or or here for any sort of training or anything like that. But North Carolina has a state board controlled uh, distribution service and system for all spirits. So. You can go, for us, we can go down to Myrtle Beach, for example, or like I can go into Lejeune or 
uh, for Liberty, and I can buy it for a dramatically reduced price versus going to the ABC store. But their pitch, which of course the government tries to sell you every program as being beneficial for everybody all the time, their pitch is um, that money goes towards state education. That money goes towards fixing the roads. And so whether or not it really does and what percentage really does and how much you know goes into whatever else. What's the tax that Tamsi said he had to pay every year? Oh. It was ask. like not lawless, but it was something comical like that because he owns a distillery yeah. and he has to pay this special tax to the state of North Carolina um, perpetuating. Yeah, he, he's a he's a good one to uh, reach out to as well. Um, all the guys uh, and I can make the introduction. I'm sure Baker can. Any, yeah. any, uh, his name's Eric Tanzi. He's a failure to stop podcast. He used to do a sideshow for Drinking Bros. Um, it's him and Mike, the cop are the main host for failure to stop. Um, but yeah, he'd be, he'd be another great one to get on, but yeah, he owns a distillery in Clayton, North Carolina. He's also a veteran. Um, I don't know to say that he is or ever was a smoker or used tobacco products. We never talked about that. You're trying to think back. To, we had a four hour long conversation with him several I months ago. I don't remember <laughs> that part of the conversation. Yeah. So I, I don't know, but he, he'd be great. Um, you know, I can't picture him as a smoker, that. but also I don't know. Um, so I guess that's kind of a good transition since we kind of started talking about policy and stuff. Let's talk uh, Vote America. What you got going on there? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay, so um, where do I start? <laughs> there are uh, there are um, a lot of opportunities for our veterans, our military, and and one demographic that uh, we we haven't talked about yet, but our hunters could be making a much bigger impact on the direction of this country if they just turned out to vote. So well, I want to share some statistics with you. We have currently about 63% of the veteran population is registered to vote. That's compared to 85% of the civilian population. So already, and, and I wouldn't think this, like, if you had asked me and I knew nothing about it, you know, who votes more, your average citizen or you know, your veteran, I would assume that our veterans would be voting at higher percentages than the average civilian. That's not the case. And then on top of that too, not just registered to vote, but when we, when we actually ask them to turn out to vote, only 26% of our veteran and military population is actually turning out to turn in their ballot and to actually vote. That's compared to 63% of civilians. So when you look across the country and you're asking yourself, you know, why the country is steering in a direction that you don't like, or if you're seeing like your these, these leaders and these politicians and you hear them stand up and say these things that you adamantly disagree with and you wonder how do they get in an office, a big part of it is because there is an entire demographic of, 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 of strong Americans, I mean, with strong opinions who, who, are, who are not turning out to vote. So, you know, the case that I'm trying to make across the country here is if you care about the Second Amendment or if you care about your hunting rights, if you care about veteran reform or, or to be honest with you, if you care about the national debt or the economy or you care about your local community or your state, we need you to go register to vote and then in November turn out to vote because you could make a sizable impact on the direction of this country just in this election cycle. So is there so a lot of places though? And today is like in Arizona, today is the last day to register to vote. So you, you, you know, if you're not doing it, uh, uh, if you haven't done it yet, you have to do it now. You need to go take a look and, and see if you haven't missed that deadline for your state. Um, but this is like our, our big final push to try to get as many veterans and service members registered to vote as we possibly can. So is your assumption coming from, you fought for the country, why would you not turn out November? Yeah, I mean, I understand it, uh, especially when you get immersed in, in, in that military community too, your priorities are on the mission and on your people and uh, rarely, do you 
are you paying attention to what's going on in politics if it's not directly affecting you? You know, I think that the military has gotten maybe even more politicized than it was when I was in, but I still think that as a, as an organization, uh, it is an apolitical organization that for the most part is, is trying to just do what it needs to to accomplish the mission and take care of its people and aren't really focused on, on that. The other thing too is when you move around as consistently or uh, as we did, I was moving about on average every two years. I think that uh, it, it gets difficult if you're re-registering at that place that you moved to. Uh, you know, you got to figure out who the politicians are in the politics and who you're voting for. Uh, if you're keeping your voter registration at your, you know, the, the place that you came from, then um, are you being able to keep tabs on all those politicians? And I think that, like, this is how I would feel is if I'm not educated on it, I'm a little bit more nervous about who I'm going to vote for. And that might be a deterrent to voting, too. So I totally get that there are all these different reasons why you 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 possibly are not voting or not um, uh, keeping tabs on those things. But you really have to. And I, I think that it's it's it, it's necessary for us to move our country in the direction that we want to I, see it going. I think um, other than, you know, maybe presidential election, it's also difficult because if you are serving a four or six or indefinite potentially, you know, commitment, depending on where you at, you're at within, you know, your, uh, your contract, um, determining in advance, am I returning to my home of record or am I staying here or am I going somewhere else entirely? You know, you may not want to vote on legislation and things that don't impact you that you're never going to move back to. So you might not really care. So projecting or figuring out those things years in advance takes a lot. For me, it was easy. My first unit was terrible. I was a medic and I was attached to a military police unit and I hated every moment of it. I was basically, Where were you? I was in South Korea. So oh, okay. all bad, right? Um, I, I just, I hated every moment of it. I knew I was getting out. Like I just, I made my decision, so I never changed anything. When I PCS down to Benning, I didn't change my license. I didn't do anything. You know, I made sure everything was still in Indiana and I still voted, you know, everything in Indiana because I knew I was going back. I wasn't as involved, but I already knew basically who I wanted to vote for, for certain things. I didn't vote, you know, mayor or anything like that. It was basically just Congress, president, things of that nature. Um, but that leads me when we were talking about the percentage of veterans that aren't uh, registered, I was just curious It popped in my mind how many, you know, the population of the veteran community that are homeless and if maybe there was a correlation with there, but it doesn't seem like it because according to what I pulled up and there is conflicting information, it's roughly 7% of homeless vets or of veterans are homeless compared to 6% of everybody else. So that doesn't really make up that 35% gap that you talked about. Um, so I wonder if what the other contributing factors are so I could, I could see homelessness being a big problem, getting registered, being able to turn out, being able to actually physically go there, you know, um, or I think the other contributing factor is they have seen the other side and when they come back home, screw this, screw the politicians, I'm taking care of my family and that's it because nobody is listening to me anyways. So disenfranchised. Essentially. Do you, do you know or have you you know sampled and surveyed uh, a, a big enough population to be able to determine why you think there's that disconnect? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, it's it's that they become apolitical in nature is the first. Uh, the transition is overwhelming. Frequent moves is also one of the things, uh, one of the top things that they respond with and just an overall disconnection from politics, especially locally. So if we, if we could like narrow it down, I mean, surveys have found that it's those kind of four things. Gotcha. Um, how do you think we can kind of make that change and push more people to turn from our community to turn out specifically? That their voice matters? Yeah. I think we're in a unique position uh, guys like you and I, where we still have our own veteran networks too. And I've asked my buddies, which ones of you are not registered to vote? And it's surprising to me, the high number of my buddies, uh, you know, who, who are very patriotic, who care about the direction of this country, um, but are not registered to vote. So we've gotten them registered to vote. So I think that there's a little bit of, uh, us and our social networks, uh, holding our, 
our uh, battle buddies accountable. I think it's also important for us to share this message. So, you know, I love the fact that you're you're out there uh, talking to the veteran community on a regular basis and 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 building uh, uh, that up in your own right too. And 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 I hope that you'll continue to to share how important it is to to register to vote and to cast your vote, uh, not just this November, but but from here on out. Um, I think that that's the concept we're trying to prove here is that uh, if we could get veteran leaders uh, to reach out to their networks to go uh, out on the, the media and talk about how important it is and, and, and highlight the, the small number of veterans that are voting compared to the civilian population, you know, then maybe we could turn the page on this. And our goal is uh, for the veteran and the military community to surpass the civilian uh, community and in, in, in our percentage of people that, that vote. I wonder, I wonder if there's a, a discrepancy between the older veteran population versus the younger veteran population. Do you know, do you have any numbers or statistics on that? No, I'll get them for you, but I think that you're absolutely right. And, and that totally makes sense to me. Uh, you know, when I got out, uh, I know Zach and I were talking about this too uh, on the After Action podcast, is it's a little bit chaotic, right? Uh, you're trying to rebuild your life. You're figuring out what the military took care of and what now you need to take care of. You're trying to find like, this direction for your life. You've got family. You've got kids. I don't know. It's, it is crazy. And so part of it might be reminding them um, of this obligation that they have to their country and the importance of it and that it's really difficult for us to undo bad political decisions and it seems that more and more of them are, are being made and if we want stronger uh, leaders in this country then we need then we need to vote so you know I, th I think it's all of that I think the mentality of when you guys came home versus when our grandparents came home from like World War II is also completely different. World War II welcomed with open arms your hero. You guys coming home, uh, the president sucks. Well, yeah. I mean, the world is falling apart. I, I, Economic I, crisis. Now you're wondering how are you going to feed your children and keep your life together? It's just a completely different situation. I think it's also, there's one of the things in my observation that I've noticed, um, all the different places I've lived, the closer proximity you are to a military installation, the more you look at veterans as just being just another group of people. And overwhelmingly, they're more of like the Florida man story type of people oh, the Marines came to Wilmington and caused a, you know, disruption downtown or... Oh, interesting. Yeah, and so where I'm from, the South Bend area, there's nothing. Um, Grissom Air Force Base is decommissioned, you know, reserve base. Um, you've got some other reserve and, and you know, guard uh, small training sites and installations and stuff, but you don't actually have... Think uh, you've got uh, where the Navy trains at outside of Chicago... Uh, and you have like Fort Knox. Did Fort Knox change names? I, I can't keep up with all these name changes. The no <laughs> but Fort Knox uh, would have been the closest army installation, and that was over four hours away. I was on the north of the state of Indiana, and that's you know southern border with Kentucky. So when I went back to South Bend, everybody was like, "Oh man, you were in the army. That's awesome." Everybody loved it. Everybody thought you're you know so cool. Tell us your stories. And then, but then again, you get closer to a military town and it's one upping, you're just another vet bro. You're go get your charger and go get into a car wreck with your 29% interest. Like it's just, it really depends on where you are in the country. So I, maybe you'd have a different feeling um, had you lived somewhere else. Maybe. I, what's, what's the population like out, out there in Arizona? I have no idea. I think Arizonans are, are super supportive of their military. It, you know, it's mostly Air Force that's out here. We do have the Army's military intelligence, I think, kind of trade-off post down here in Sierra Vista. Um, 
but a lot of Air Force. I think, um, but I think overall, we have a, a super supportive community. Okay, so we also have a lot of stars that came from Arizona, right? You had um, Frank Luke, who uh, was a World War II ace who lived out here. Um, you had, obviously, Pat Tillman uh, is from Arizona State, played for the Cardinals. Um, he, he's from our state, too. Um, Joe Foss is also another World War II ace. He was the first NFL commissioner. And oh. I know he, he, I think there was a general manager for a sports team, too. But um, he started the Joe Foss Institute, which... Um, just as a side note, there's a really cool organization that fought to ensure high school and college graduates were taking civics uh, civics tests at the end. So I don't know if you saw this movement about 10 years ago. Uh, Governor Ducey in Arizona was the first state to sign it into law that you needed to know, you know, about the history of this country, which included, you know, some questions about the major battles and wars that we've been in and conflicts. And so that just recently got passed in Arizona. So, um, and, and, and I think in 18 other states across the country. Um, so I think that we are very supportive of our military out here. The, what I thought was, was kind of cool is, you know, I was army infantry and I was at Fort Benning and Fort Hood. Those are the two bases that I spent most of my time at. Right. And, uh, and everybody knows like, you know, who the army guys are and, uh, what the different units are, but because I came out to Arizona and to the air force people, they, uh, you know they're much more interested in in what's going on in the army whereas i felt almost similar to it sounds like the way that um that you felt too andrews they were like well you're nothing special get out of here you're just like you know just yeah. like one of us um so i mean arizona is like that i think each of the different communities are a little bit different i do think that uh Unlike maybe the Vietnam era, we have a lot of institutional support. I mentioned Pat Tillman. You know, you've got the Tillman Center out here that, uh, among other things, is a giant sort of welcome home for veterans as soon as they transition out and they're, you know, at least moving into some sort of, you know, degree program at ASU. They're going through the Tillman Center. But I think that there's lots of different groups like that that really welcome you home. And, and we can't leave out, you know, uh, e e even the, the USO, I, I loved it when I came home and the USO was still out there cheering us on as we came through the airport and stuff. So no, and I, I know that, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to get, uh, me to, to defend the administration. Um, uh, we could share offline or some other times the more politically involved stuff that I got into, but I formally served as the executive director, the kind of chief of staff of the Arizona Republican Party for a while. And so um, <laughs> I know some stories from there. out there. But but I don't want people to get the impression that like America doesn't welcome their soldiers home because, you know, the, the whether and it's a nonpartisan issue. People, I think Americans love their service members and their veterans. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely nothing at all like it was for Vietnam. But but in as today as well, you you have a lot of people that um, put emphasis on their anecdotes or their experiences. You know, if, if a veteran does or a service member does come back from something, even maybe it's just training or whatever, and they're in uniform and they're seeking special treatment or they're seeking that welcome home and then they want to put themselves on TikTok because they want some clout or whatever, you know, like I, I think that that's problematic for both aspects, you know, people embellishing and saying, oh, I did all this, yeah. praise me. And then you have the people that come back and maybe genuinely had a bad experience coming back. There are people in the country that simply don't like the military and that's fine. Um, but you know, you don't have to make a big deal about it at the airport. You don't have to make a big deal. If, if it's impacting your family or your health and welfare, sure. But I don't need to go to the news and be like, nobody said hi to me at the airport. That's just social media is like killing us, honestly. Yeah, like uh, whether it's you know the stolen valor stuff that we see on a regular basis, or you know just the 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 veteran infighting, or I don't know what you call it, where you're like, it's it's a pissing match, right? Or like who's more badass, right? Yep. And you're like, you know, I don't it's, know. It's it's a sibling it's rivalry. It's, just, it's it's yeah yeah. You all hate each other, and then when you're in the foxhole together, you're like, fine. 
let's do this. Let's get out of here. And then we'll get back to Big Room when we get home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, she, she's like, I hate it. You guys are so dumb. <laughs> No, so I, and honestly, like that, I enjoy, uh, you know, I enjoy it when it's, it's done in the right way, right? Like your your uh, healthy uh, camaraderie and rivalry and, and trash talking. Um, when it becomes like, no, I actually think that, like, for some reason, my service is above your service. It always just bothers me. I see it, and I'm like look, man, like you all made, like you all had an incredibly important part to play and we're all part of this sort of balanced ecosystem that just one one person or one one of those roles steps out while you're in a combat situation and the whole thing falls apart. So it's, uh, I've I seen, think it's important to remember that everybody plays this part into our success together. I've seen a big push recently with some of the bigger accounts, especially on Twitter, because that's where I see most of this, um, with people saying, hey, be proud of your service, you don't need to embellish it. And it's both, it's combating stolen valor, but it's also like, dude, we need like cooks, we need supply. You don't have to say that you were special forces. We, <laughs> You were an essential part of the mission. Um, and, and to that point, we actually had Anthony Anderson from Stolen Valor, Guardian of Valor on uh, a couple weeks ago as well. And I followed the uh, Steve Slatton, Steve Slayton, however you say his name, that whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was out in Arizona. Yeah. I, He's I, from my state. I followed that whole story from when he, you know, was, was breaking it and talking about all of his embellishments and rewriting his DD-214 and all that nonsense. And I happened to be at Benning when they did the, uh, like, official, I don't, I don't know what what they, the actual term was welcome home ceremony for the Vietnam veterans where they invited them in from all across the country. And we had to go out there outside of NIM and stand in formation for several hours so they could come out there and, you know, have their, their party and everything like that. And I, of course, you know, I have a really small account on, on X Twitter. Uh, so I was like, Hey, were you, do, were, were you there by any chance? Like, could I find you in the crowd? Can I go and check the records? Cause I was there. You know, I'm, I'm in the picture there. Obviously I wasn't in Vietnam, but I was, I was there for that ceremony. Were you there as well? Never responded to me. And of course he blocked most people <laughs> who questioned him well, on X. With Steve Slayton is a really good example that, uh, long before they needed to find the evidence, like that, the, there were, there was smoke before there was fire, right? Like, you know, he had a reputation already where veterans that I had known would be like, yeah, man, this dude, I know this guy's full of shit, right? You made up this story during this uh, this LD meeting or this Lincoln Day lunch. And so, what it, you know, we, that's what I mean is the veteran community almost will know beforehand because you'll hear it from people. And what I've noticed about Arizona, too, is like the veteran advocacy space, which has its own like little spaces, too. You have people that are focused on workforce development. And you have people that are focused on the veteran courts or veteran homelessness. But what those those are even smaller little like little uh, um, sections compared to the bigger and and so everybody is talking to each other too and so I do think that there's a decent amount of like a, a safety net and and safeguards in place to prevent guys like Steve Slayton from getting away with it because it was clearly like trying to create an embellishment you know that that helped his political career um helped him stand on stage with with wendy rogers right yeah and uh and so we we were able to address that but i do love too that it's it's forcing this conversation about this dialogue too and while i do think that especially uh you know in the in the army too you know your your combat arms get a lot of of the positive attention i think the especially the infantry guys are for in my case, we were living in Missoula in a combat outpost, and they picked it because it was like then the place where the most SIG acts were happening the year before. So they placed all of the infantry uh, companies at combat outposts where the most danger was happening. So we are living in that reality. But at the same time, um, you know, your impact is not, I think, any bigger than the impact of of any of the other service members that are serving, and the role that they're playing is 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 just as critically important um i i just think that it's 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 more about us understanding that we are are one organization and one team and we need to defend and, and protect each other 
um, against the rest of the world, to be honest with you. Right. You know, I was, I was thinking there, um, we were talking about how fast in all the channels that the news spreads through. I wonder if somebody can come up with uh, like a, was it six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon? I wonder what that would be from like veteran to veteran. Like if we, if we had like a key member of the veteran community, like what is everybody's degree of separation from that one key member? <laughs> that, I'm trying to think who might be like the Kevin Bacon. Is that yeah, what you think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, you know, who'd probably be a good one because he's so popular is Jocko. True. Yeah. That'd be, yeah. He kind of connects to a lot of people. Um, yeah, I'd be curious. Uh, Mad Dog has been around for a long time. Yeah. Um, General Mattis, that's who he's talking about. Trying to think of. It just, I don't know. It, it's, there's a lot of people that were in the influencer space that I think kind of fit it, but. I think having somebody with a good reputation is probably better than having somebody just some, I don't want to throw out some names. I have some bad blood with a couple of people. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. Right. Nothing <laughs> negative, Andrew. <laughs> um, but a any other, uh, any other keynotes or topics or things that you want to cover before we wrap it up here? No, look, uh, this is, this is more personal than professional. I've had a, a rough two years uh, uh, losing some of my battle buddies too. And um, not that there's anything that you can do to, to change it, but I do want to remind people to just check on their buddies too. Um, there's nothing obviously you could do when it, when it happens, you can't go back in time. And so uh, I, I feel a lot of regret for now talking to some of my, my battle buddies more and seeing if I could make that, that bigger impact. And so I just didn't, encourage you all out there to to just check on your buddies too yeah i have uh my pll clerk from my first unit he's not on social media and i have his birthday in my calendar and if nothing else we talk to each other on each other's birthdays and just so that's typically about four to six months apart and we talk to each other around those two times and then periodically there might be some other conversations sprinkled in there so i think that'd be you know something that everybody should consider doing start putting your friend's birthdays in your calendar you can put it right there in your context you already have their number and their name saved put their birthday in there send them a little text or give them a call on their birthday and that could make all the difference um i also use memorial day and veterans day um but yeah you know as a reminder and an opportunity to r reach out to to my buddies too yeah, that's... So I love that. I love uh, saving their birthdays. Uh, us dudes aren't very good at, you know, remembering each other's birthdays. So that's, 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 I like that suggestion too. We don't really, we don't really celebrate it unless it's your 21st. I mean, outside of I your... know. That's, that's a they, lie. They, no, he makes the entire month about him for his birthday. That is a lie. That is the biggest lie you have ever I meant, said. I meant, I meant like our, our friends. Our friends don't say, hey, let's go on you support your 24th birthday. Every, so he has everything on his Facebook shut off except for the month of December so that people can comment on his page about happy birthday, St. Andrew. Uh, <laughs> My you gotta, God. You got to celebrate us on our birthday. Yeah. Like get a good, good, strong birthday month in there. Yeah. Hey, you were off social media for a long time. I, mm -hmm. I posted about you. You just <laughs> didn't know about it. But something that you've said a couple of times, battle buddies, I think that's a great uh, initiative for that back to the smokeless. And that could be your, your challenge group name. Keep, keep each other accountable. Yeah, to yeah. your battle buddies. That's your new group name. Well, that's Thanks. that's I what like we... It. It's a good one. That's the like the term when you have... Uh, somebody that has to be accountable for you while you're like in training and even. Okay. So then there deployed. it's perfect. Yeah. So, um, the battle buddy is pretty funny because in the very beginning too, uh, you know, you're not allowed to go anywhere without your battle buddy, right? You're not allowed to, uh, I think during basic training, right? Like aside going to maybe the restroom and taking a shower, you're not going anywhere without your buddy. So perfect. Um, now they're tasked with smacking it out of your hand. That's right. That's right. I have, uh, 
um, I have a very close battle buddy that I was with too. And it was, uh, we had this, uh, unique circumstance where we were in each other's squad in every part of our training. It was because our last names were right next to each other. And so like the way that they did, uh, you know, even, even when they tried to mix it up somehow, we ended up in the same, in each other's squad in both, uh, the infantry school, airborne school, and ranger school. Oh. And so, uh, and we've uh, stayed friends ever since. So we ran into each other at the career course too. And um, and anyway, so I'll have to talk to him because he's an a he, he dips a lot still too. Maybe we could go in. Yes, on yes. And and we'll we'll let let everybody know that Nona was the inspiration. For <laughs> no, you were, you were. So so that brings up two questions here, real quick, uh, as we wrap yeah. it up. When when did you go through Ranger School? Two thousand eight. Oh, uh, so you were already right, up. It would have been right before I got there. I was cadre, medical when, cadre at fourth. Did you go? Uh, September two thousand nine, and I was there from September two thousand nine till December two thousand ten. Yeah, you were in oh. Korea at that point in two thousand eight, right? Yeah. 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 So you guys just missed uh, each other. So, uh, I feel for you in having to go through the the winter. I was one of those unique individuals who got to go through. Oh, oh so I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't go oh. through at the winter. I, I PCS there, and I was cadre there, and I went while I was there. I went in March. But Oh, oh okay, yeah. okay. My uh, my squad leader wanted to try and convince me to stay in, and I loved it. RTB was awesome. But I was, he should have stayed in. I had, that, I had that bad experience. I was like, I know I'm going to end up going to another terrible unit. I might have another terrible command or something terrible and I'm going to hate it and I'm going to be miserable and I'm going to regret having signed that contract and so I got out. Um, the other question that I had for you. Well, and, you also cut him off. He was in the middle of saying something. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I was just going to, uh, not a lot of people know about this, but there's this, uh, if you're what they call a best ranger recycle, do you remember the best ranger competition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a cool probably one. had to work it, right? You're yep. running it? Yep. Okay, do you remember you got all these... Uh, um, indentured servants called ranger students, yep. right? That you like took down there and got to treat it as, yep. as poorly as you wanted to. So there's, um, so if you recycle in the last, uh, class of winter, which I recycled up in Dahlonega during that last phase, right? You have to sit around for three or four weeks and basically, you know, be, um, you know, be the, the privates for the best ranger competition. And then you get the the benefit of of then having to be in the very first summer class and and for me going down to Florida. So it's like had to suffer through mountains in the winter and summer down in Florida. I really don't think us best ranger recycles ever get enough credit for having to like like and then nobody else has to stay in that long for recycling for one phase. Yeah. Right. You're somehow there for an extra five weeks just being, you know. Yeah, we had we turn around had, the mentality. It means you were special by, by Ranger cadre like like Andrew here. Yeah, we only had uh, three. We had three breaks while I was there. We had one ten day block leave over the summer. We had one of uh, the Christmas Exodus, and then we had the one for BRC. And those are the only three Christmas and Exodus. Just the holiday, like the holiday Exodus, whatever. Oh yeah, that's what they call it. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, the, so I, re I remember the question that I want to ask you, um, yeah. for smokeless vet, uh, is there any opportunity to get that? I don't know what they call it now, but what it used to be, or I think might still be the eight cap program, the, um, you know, the transitions progress yeah. program that you go through at the end. Yeah. So that is something that we're exploring to, uh, like I, I think one of the, the best things that that we could share with them is, you know, the research um, that we found too, and so being able to plug that into like your your transition phase and and getting you out and getting that information into their hands, I think is 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 a great idea, and um, and we'll be pushing for that too. As long as you don't give vets or service members at the time like me that go through, and I'm just like, I already know what I'm doing. I don't want to talk to you. Just stamp my paperwork, please. <laughs> that I mean, you know, that's kind of the way that I was when I was transitioning out to. Um, I really appreciated the the three versions of my resume. But I do think that there's and that's a whole, you know, a different podcast on 
you know, how they can make that more uh, meaningful and effective for veterans getting out. And I think that that starts actually on day one of your enlistment. I think we need to take a whole new approach on how we're helping veterans transition out. And that starts with understanding that you're not taking a break. This is not like um, your vacation from your life as in the military. This is a piece of, of a phase of or a building block of, of what you're trying to create before you get out. And I think if you appreciate it in those terms, as opposed to maybe how sometimes we were sold on as like, hey, you know, go out and see the world before you know you you go to college or things like that. I think you should look at it like these are skills that are gonna help me in life too. And and I think that there's a way for us to capture those a little bit better through the joint services transcript. But we'll have to save that for a different episode. Yeah. Well, we'd love to have you back on. Um, you. I'd love to come back on. Other than uh, all the links, which I'll get from you, uh, for yeah. those listening and watching, uh, if you're on YouTube, they'll be in the description, pin comment everywhere else. They'll be in descriptions. There'll be links and blah, 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 everywhere else. Uh, and we'll source all that from you. Is there anywhere else uh, you'd like people to find you? Any social media channels or anything like that? No, I'd love that. If you follow me on um, matt.kenny.us on Instagram, uh, you find me there or uh, Matt Kenny USA on Twitter. Uh, love to connect with you guys on those spaces. But please check out uh, smokelessvets.org and vote the number four America.org. Uh, I want you all involved. We can make a huge impact, but there's not a lot of time left. And so uh, we need you to go check on that today or tomorrow. Get registered to vote. Make sure you're casting your ballot and making a difference for the uh, future of our country. Awesome. Well, Matt, uh, it was a pleasure having you on. And um, like I said, look forward to having you. should also reach out to, uh, um, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, EOD Happy, Happy Captain on uh, Twitter. He's, oh, got, yeah. he's, got a, he's got a pretty good pretty good podcast that's really popular with the military and veteran space, specifically on Twitter as well. So it's a good way to really get involved with them. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a fan. He, uh, he posts some really good content. He's very positive. I think a good influence on, uh, on service members too. Yeah, he's and some of those pictures happy. are crazy. This is an EOD guy who, who's been doing it for, you know, I guess well, it's probably, he's probably at about 15 years, right? Um, he's had some wild experiences in his, in his I, suits and with the robots. And I actually think he might be getting close to retirement. Um, do you know who Mary Dague is? And her husband, um, his name's evading me right now. Um, he just retired, and they were enlisted together. I don't know if they were the same rank, but I believe uh, they were pretty close within a couple of years or so. so. I mean, you might be right at fifteen years. Yeah, you're right. So, yeah. No, I all I was saying though is I just think that um, one, he's been a really positive influence on the community. And in addition, it's also just fun to follow him because he's got all kinds of yeah. uh, cool, cool EOD photos. Yeah, absolutely. Well, once again, thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll be sure to follow you. We'll get this episode will actually go out tomorrow. So for those watching, listening to this, we recorded it like eighteen hours ago. <laughs> so uh, Matt, again, thanks for coming on, and uh, everybody quit smoking. Yeah. If that's right, thanks, Nona. Andrew, it was a pleasure. Can't wait to come back on, chat with you guys again. All right. Thank you.